Hello all, Game of Thuzla. Well, I'm doing a video now because my writing partner, Steve Key, says, I've got to do another video. We have been pushing very hard on getting the game system perfected. Um, it's like any sort of labor of love. You know, you get it done, you look at it, you think, God, it's great. Then you sit down and you play it the next week and you find 16 different holes you didn't know you had and you start patching them and fixing them. And then as you do so and you've realized you've reached perfection, you go, well, this works really great, but this over here doesn't work quite as well. So you're constantly doing the massage to make the rules better. Now, at some point, the great gets in the way of the good. And what you have to do is say, look, we've got to get enough of it produced and out there so that people can play it and get it going and then they can give us their feedback on what they like. Um, it was nice having a lot more play testers in town this month. We got a lot more games in. We got a lot more feedback and information. And a lot of things I sort of know how it goes in a game um, really come up in a play test. And that's what's good about play testing and getting people involved. You want everyone to push the game, to try to break the rules, to try to cheese the play out so that you can get as much of the problems that potentially exist in a game into the light and you can figure out ways to work them out. And we've done that. Every time there's been a problem, we all sit down and brain test and work it out and figure out how the system is going to work. Steve and I have a standard Tuesday, Wednesday morning coffee meet so that we can discuss all the previous week's games, how what worked, what didn't work, what we need to improve, what we found weak, what we found great, and go from there. In so saying, I'm really excited about the game. Every time I play it, I enjoy playing it. I DM'd it last night. Um, I had a great time. We had a, a really good adventure. Uh, the week previous, we had a huge battle in the Twilight of Fae campaign, and it was all against the elves. And at the end of it, a lot of people said, yes, I, I now know why everybody hates your elves. And it's kind of true. You know, if you can put the kind of color into your role playing and not have to spend the time constantly concentrating on the mechanics of the rules, it makes for better role playing. There's always a push me pull you. Um, and even if you produce the greatest set of rules in the world, it's not necessarily going to be played by the most people. I mean, I have played, been playing role-playing games uh, for 50 years, more likely longer than most of you have been alive. And I find that what are some of the greatest games often go completely unnoticed, um, unheralded. I mean, for those of you who know about my D&D, I love 4th Edition. I, I thought 4th Edition was a great game. I liked it better than any other supplement of D&D except for D&D Zero, where I could pretty much do just anything I wanted because they only gave you a pamphlet. And since there really weren't any rules, it was all up to me to decide when players say, okay, I want to stand over my down friend and defend him against the bugbear stepping on his head. That was easy to do. I could just say, okay, you have this advantage and this disadvantage. Make your roll, see if you do it. And he stops four hits because you did it. Yay. And you save the day. And that made the gaming very fast, flow very easy, and allowed me to concentrate on the storyline, the role playing, the things people wanted to have in the game, and look for those moments to have great excitement. You've heard my discussions on nauseam on that. In producing a set of rules for ourselves, we wanted to keep all of the excitement we could possibly do in the game and get a lot of the time out. And that we've been very successful at. Now, I don't want to necessarily bore you with the minutia, but the idea is the players essentially roll all the dice. So on your turn, depending on whether you have initiative or don't have initiative, you either attack and then defend. Now, in doing so, attack has advantages in the dice, and that's kind of how we wanted to produce a game. A game that had lots of like greeb little dice and things to push around, and interesting things to play with, and little moonstones, and all kinds of doodads that make the game fun, and a little bit more interesting. But the other thing is, it keeps the visual going and this game playing very quickly. It's amazing, once you pull the DM out of having to roll dice and check charts and everything else, the point was, it's been going great. The fact that we could sit down, run a evening session with three encounters, um, role playing, character generation, and everything else, and get done in less than three hours was amazing. And we're able to do that on a regular basis. We're able to have mega battles. I mean, mega battles where scores, 20, 30, 40, 50 bad guys on the one side, and we play still only a couple hours to get the game done. 
Now, there's a lot of factors in that. And of course, you could imagine that you're always having to give up something. And I think a lot of what you're giving up is what I sort of call the 3.5 effect. The idea that, you know, you just got so much that you have to plan and know and how well you're able to manipulate character generation and unification of the different uh, you know, branches and the like. And I'm not going to say that's not here. I mean, we're dealing with that constantly in a situation where people are trying to find a way to sort of maximize all the different things you can do to give yourself a differential advantage in the game. That's what we wanted to see. That's what we wanted to see in playtesting. But what more importantly is, that's how the game is designed to work. The idea that a super powerful elf lord is not necessarily going to have some huge number of hits. It's he's just going to have the ability to make multiple parries and multiple attacks. And he's going to be tough to stop. He does If you can hit him, if you can get to him, if you get lucky, you know you can take out a big monster. Last night in the battle... We had this sort of corrupted tree man and a bunch of fairies that were all under his control assaulting the party. They're trying to rescue him and deal with what it was. And there was a super crit at the one critical moment that killed barely the big baddie. And it was dramatic. It was the kind of thing you want in a game. Again, it's fast. It's fast and furious. And even a long, drawn-out battle doesn't feel long and drawn out because the turns are quick. And since the players are doing all the rolling, it has a situation where the DM doesn't bog the game down. It doesn't go, you're going to turn, you make a roll, something happened, something didn't happen. The next person, something that's happened, didn't, something didn't happen. And you just go around and you're waiting. Now the DM comes and he's got 27 creatures to move. And, and it seems like basically it's the DM. And I've it's always sort of felt this way. The DM is the one who is sort of choreographing a giant play production that you have a small part in. I really want it to be much more of the fact that the I'm laying down the storyline and I've got the scripts. Everything else is being done by you. But when it gets to your turn, you know your attacks and defenses. So it's a matter of real simple. You've got two defenses at disadvantage and you make your attack at advantage, make your rolls. What is the outcome? I, you know, and then based upon your roles and everything else, you just deliver me a damage point. I then you know, are able to apply that and tell you what goes on from there. It's even working in a situation that eventually is going to be all down on my three by five cards. So I can actually plop it on the board and most of the players can don't even need to look if they don't they have to ask me, well, what do I need to do this or what do I need to do that? It's just all there spelled out in front. Very fast. Um, very flexible, very interesting, a very dynamic way to create things. I was very skeptical with Steve's concept initially on the way that the monsters would work. Turns out it works out great. And the other thing is it makes monsters really, really dangerous without making them ponderous. I mean, a giant, huge monster, yeah, he may be very tough to hit, but if you can get lucky and maybe pierce the, the place where there's, you know, the scales don't cover the heart, you could finish him off in an instant. If not, you may never be able to beat him off. And that is something that I've always wanted in a game and have been very lucky to be able to achieve it here in a factor that we can play it. The game is quick to get up, get to run. It's quick to organize it with players. I'm getting people who always, as players do, want to take it off the rails and, and go in some different direction. And I love the people who want to argue the rules with you. And when you're telling them, well, wait, you, you do understand this is a play test. The rules are this way today. They might not be this way tomorrow. Or if you tell me the rules were this way four months ago, why are they different now? Uh, play test. You know, it's a matter of finding that perfect niche of what's going to make the game fun for you. The important thing to remember about this is this is what you should be doing as a DM in any game system you're running. When you've got a group and they love a set of rules and it doesn't matter if it's D&D Zero &D or D&D Fifth &D Edition and anything in between or Rune Quest or Dragon Quest or Fantasy Trip, all those things that are out there for you to play. You find a skeleton that works and that you enjoy. From that point, get feedback from your players. If they say, you know, I love the game, but this one little piece of the rule really bugs me. Sit down and say, well, how can we make it better? This is what the playtesting is obviously doing for us nowadays. We sit and we talk it out. We come up with a solution. And at the end, you go, wow, that is a way better way to play that than what we were doing before. Now, we've done this in ready rules for 
over four decades. You know, some things just don't work. Even though it was meant to work, at some point, the people writing the rules had to, you know, go, look, we got to get it out there. We got to pay our mortgage, you know, and all the rest of it. So we've got to get the rules out there for people to play. And that's what tends to be important in rule game designers. For someone like me, who's trying to produce something that gets my excitement going, I just want to bring you along for the ride. I want you to be playing it and enjoying it and seeing what I'm doing and then playing in the campaigns that I'm running and getting you to feedback as well to me. And that's it. Now, I think as we get going forward, I'm going to start wanting to do videos. Um, maybe we'll start figuring out how to do live streams where we can talk about, okay, we're going to do a quick video, have the video camera running tonight while we run an adventure. I, I, I frighten and, and, and terrorized by this because I did this once with my friend Donna Maria and her, her group. And the whole idea was is that I filmed four hours of video and was able to edit it down to a, an hour and 30 minutes because I pretty much had to. I mean, people don't realize how much table talk tends to come up. I mean, when you watch something like Critical Role, you realize these guys are the pros from Dover. They have this down to a point where they understand when that light comes on and that camera starts rolling, we're in character and we are running it to make sure it is entertainment for the players and they do a fabulous job. And that's what I like to see. If you're watching an actual game, you know, sometimes it's just boring. I mean, people get up and talk and they do this and they do that and they start rambling about stuff and they're off on a tangent and, and you know, it, it happens. Real life, as every time, gets in the way of the good gaming. But it shouldn't. If you can get it to a point where in what we have done, we dump it all back in the laps of the players. And as the DM, I sit here with not a die in front of me. The interesting thing is what we did not want is even though the mechanics are going to work pretty much exactly the same for everybody, we didn't want them to feel the same for everybody. So the idea is different. The standard, of course, is you always start with the way the warriors work. The warriors work with an attack, disadvantage, you know, parries, reposts, damage taken, does armor stop damage, all that very quick and very fast. What you're looking for is the game changers, the criticals, the double nines, you know, and things like that. They're going to fundamentally change the way your character design. Because we're not doing it on set skills that you just kind of boringly get up. The idea is when you do something, when you crit it, you've had an enlightenment. You found something new in that. On the off season, when you're doing your character and amending and updating it, you're able to turn one of these things that you have critted in this adventure season into a skill you now have. So now you always have advantage on your sword. Now the great part with that is, if you're fighting multiple opponents, or if you're just fighting one-on-one, -on -one, you say, okay, then so instead of fighting normally, I will fight with an advantage, or I'll defend with an advantage, or I'll give away my defense and fight with a double advantage. There's so many different ways to modify the way the skill goes. It's still up to the player, it's still very fast, it still gives the dynamic based upon what they're playing with. And again, that's what I wanted. Speed and excitement, and the fact that what you end up with, because you're accumulating your skills, both in magic, and everything else via when you are able to make a critical role. And the critical role then allows you then to modify your skills and go up from there. And so every time you risk something, there's a risk reward. And the risk reward is what we're playing to. The idea of how much do you want to risk, how much do you want to increase the chance of either you getting some kind of really cool skill or more importantly, you outright killing a monster. It's worked really well. And I know it's more likely confusing you at this point, and I apologize for that, but I wanted to let you know that it's done. Uh, it's done to the point that really I feel good about getting it into people's hands. So those of you who are interested, make sure you're on my Patreon page or you're telling me about it. Um, you can send me messages here, but it's a lot harder for me as often to dig out, um, you know, different different phone numbers off of different sites. Because I don't always, you know, I'll read my messages for maybe the first week or two, and then after that, I might not see it. So if you see this video a month from now, I might not go back that often and find you. I still do. I look back and see if to try to find if there's any additional comments and people want to talk about stuff, because that's what makes this game and this interaction on the internet fun, that we all get to talk about the hobby we dearly love. Because I feel that if this is something that's going to be very, very 
pleasant for me to get it out there for you to utilize and tear apart and find ways to make it better so that we build this down the road to have another option of a good game system because game systems are only really as good as the players utilizing them. And if you're going to love them and utilize them and fix them and make them fit into your world, then you're going to really enjoy them. Fantasy Trip, I've played for many, many decades. I've fine-tuned, modified, changed, done things with my group over the, over the years. Um, to that end, people ask me, you know, the, why there's no death save in the game. Well, death save was really easy. It was the amount of damage you took over your health, less your maximum health. So if you had a 20 strength, you took three over, you had a 17, you were only going to fail on an auto fail. But if you had a 14 strength and you hit four points of damage, you're at a 10, you have to make a 10 or less on 3d6 to survive. If you do so, then you're, you're fine, you're unconscious, and you can come back from there. Um, there's ways of modifying that. We did things, and, and like what I'm doing in the game currently, is when you go down in this game, you roll two dice, and it, you either make your roll and you're unconscious, and then every round you can roll to see if you have a chance of getting a hit point back and sort of stunning, you know, they come back to your feet, or you die. And the problem is, every time you, pick, you have to make a roll, every round you have to pick up another die. And when you roll, you pick the worst two. And that's the problem. Uh, now, the only thing that's going to get you is a double zero. But eventually, if you're rolling six dice, seven dice, eight dice, you're going to end up rolling a double zero. Now, we've only had two deaths that way because it adds that drama every round. And what's nice is it makes people want to get their clerics, their healers in there. And even somebody who's just a lousy healer to go up there and say, look, I'm just going to try to do first aid to stop the bleeding. It all works. And... It maybe doesn't work well, but it does work. And it makes for the game to be very exciting and interesting. And again, what we found to be very fast. Now, there's always a sacrifice to speed. You know, there there is some detail being given up. There are some things that a lot of you look at and go, I'm not sure this is what I want to do. A lot of it I wasn't sure I wanted to do. But the moment I started playing it, I was like, nah, I don't like this. Uh, well, well I, it's okay. By the fourth adventure of using a system, yeah, it's like, I cannot imagine doing this any other way and playing the game because it gives you all the things you want. And when you have little problems, it's so easy to find a plug that fixes the problem. That's what I liked. Now, I still yak more about this than I wanted to, so I will stop. I'll show you some little vignettes here of little photos of things we've done, but I want to let you know that I am just pounding on this thing, have been doing so as much as I possibly can due to age, injury, health, uh, the world affairs, and everything else going on. But to let you know, this is still the main focus and the main desire in my life is to get this out there in your hands, even if it's just a few of you playtesting it, who are going to be feeding back to me so we can run maybe a worldwide campaign of, of my Twilight of Fae game. And if nothing more than that ever happens, I will still be pleased. But I think we're going to get more out of it. And I think that I would love to have you part of it. So if you're out there and you're interested, like I said, throw me a dollar and get on my twi my Patreon page. Let's start talking there. I've got other ways of getting in, in sort of live communications with people so we can get together maybe every other week or whatever with me and Steve and start doing Q&As of people once you're playing the game. Don't need a ton. Don't need a ton of playtesters. Don't even looking for a ton. But if we had four or five groups who really were interested, great, more even more so, but I really want to get it out there in your hands and getting you playing the game because it was more likely one of the most enjoyable campaigns I ever ran. And obviously, if you've even listened to Matt Coville when his interview on me and other things he's talked about since then, I think it was one of the best games that he and my group ever played. And it was in a D&D 3.5 and a fourth edition. Not really what I would have considered the best systems for running a game, but it runs great because as I've said, it's really up to you and the players to make your games great because the game system doesn't matter. The quality of it at the end of the night is how exciting you made the game. And so far, like I said, the way this game runs, it's got lots of built-in excitement in the game. The rest of it is still up to me and the DMs that are running it. And the great thing about it is, since you know it's not going to take six hours, 
you know, it makes the game more fun. You know, you bang it out, you're home by midnight. I, it's amazing. So I hope that you guys haven't missed me a whole lot. And I hope that those of you who are interested, stay in touch with me. I also want to talk about the painting challenge that you know about. Thank you very much to some of the people who are getting back miniatures to me. To some of you who have, have not received miniatures, I, I apologize. If you are overseas, I ran into a huge boondoggle on that. And the huge boondoggle was this. I don't mind giving you $20, $30 worth of rare figures to paint, because especially if you guys are good painters, especially since some of you might actually send me a figure back of yours that I could have signed, and then I can put it up for auction, or I can just put it into the museum down on the, the road, or just get it up there and show it to people. And I want to start showing you some of the miniatures that, that have been done, because what amazed me is miniatures I hated back in the 70s and 80s, and I gave away. I'm like, God damn, good, glad to be rid of this. You know, let somebody else suffer with this miniature for 30 years. And they paint it and return it to me, and I'm like, Damn, that looks good. You know, what? I would have never thought of something. You know, my friend Rod, he did a miniature of these two halflings done by Grenadier. It was one of the worst miniatures I ever saw. One halfling standing on top of another halfling looking off into the distance. Hated it. He hated it back in these really dull browning and blacks and like rogues. And I looked at it and I thought, it's perfect. It's exactly what it should have been. So I've got to send him another one because I have a bunch of these. And I'm like, I'll send them all to you. You can paint them all. I'd give them to your other friends or keep them or do whatever you want. You know, that's what I like. Remember, the whole point is get out there and game with your friends. If you can game live, if you can get new people involved, that's the best part. The other thing, too, is always get more people involved. Again, if you're interested in what I'm doing, get a shout out back to me and we'll get you involved. Uh, for those of you overseas who wanted to get into the painting challenge, it's going to be a little tougher. Uh, $25, uh, $15 was the cheapest I was able to get out to Canada, $25 and up. Uh, I sent something to Dubai. I really didn't want to tell you what that cost me. Um, and I haven't even been confirmed that these people have even received these and I can't keep that up. I mean, I'm on an old guy on a fixed income, so I don't mind giving you the rare figures. What I do mind is having to pay 30 bucks to ship it to you. So if you want them and you're willing to cover the shipment out of the country, I've got no issue with that. I will get them right out to you. Other than that, you know, I'm using these little air mailers. I can ship you a couple miniatures in an air mailer. It usually costs me about three bucks, which of course I can handle. So hopefully you'll be getting more miniatures out there. Some of you who have not. If you think that I have your name and you haven't received a miniature yet, make sure you send me a little shout out. Say, hey, wait, wait, I thought I was going to get something. And get me, send me your address again. I have a master list of what I've sent it out to. So I can check that and say, oops, you didn't get any shipment. So I'll get it out to you. And we'll keep you in the loop. So hopefully get more done. Those of you who are interested get in touch with me. Those of you who are sculptors or painters, I've got some of your names of people to contact me and they want to get to know. I'm trying to work that out, see where we might have some funding down the road, hopefully, because the idea is that what I want to do is when we do the play test, when we finally get it kickstarted or printed or self-printed or however we get it out there into the world, all the people involved in play test that I want to make sure they get a unique Albion Twilight of Fate figure that only the people who are involved in the playtesting will have. So somewhere late down on the line, you can say, ha ha, I've got a Game of Thuzla original Elvin Finvara miniature because I was one of the original playtesters and yay. So hope everything's going well for everybody. Keep your heads down in the crazy world. Hope everyone's doing as well as you can. Remember, we'll get through this and fight me devil's fight for I hate peace. Game on everybody and have a great week. The party has pursued the the rogues who have captured one of their party members, the wizard who pretends to be a fae, and they've followed her back to some underground lair, which actually turns out to be real fae, who apparently have captured her for some of their own nefarious reasons. So now the elves here, as they break into the final room after battling here, have lined up to encounter the heroic five powerful plus a few others added on uh, heroes for the final battle. The mega elven battle has been incredible. They have been battling on this to try to save people's lives and people have been going down and murdering stuff and interesting. High mana areas are uh, very, very deadly. Nice play test. We're wandering into a battle scene and we find this dragon flying towards us and all of a sudden out of the ground via like sort of Harryhausen, we've got 20 undeads that rise out of the ground to cause us some discomfort. So we will see how this goes. Hopefully the dragon's just here to observe and not breathe horrible fire on us, but I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Our second encounter is with another dragon. This one's red, and he's brought his little paratrooping minions. They're like little, you know, American Force Recon guys who, like, slide in and, and, and kill us. The first one did the attack us, and, well, I hit it with an area of effect fireball, which incinerated them all. 
But this time they got us in this room, so I can't drop a fireball without, well, maybe torching everybody else. So we'll see how this one goes, but so far it's been fun. Final encounter is against apparently a Medusa or Gorgon with a bow. She has been firing with her minions who have been shooting at us and hiding. But now she has stepped forward, and we will see how this final encounter goes. Because, of course, the other two dragons, well, they both ran away because they were, like, gutless. Suckers. Weak. Frail. Cowardly. The Medusa was able to teleport to the statue, but uh, that was not so much fun. This could get Ugg and Lee, but she's the lone sister, so that's okay.